Okay, welcome back. Uh, my name is Jesse, and I sat the game set last year, but I'm sitting it again this year as well. But I'm also making a whole bunch of different videos on section two and section three for GAMSAT. But in this series, what I do is run through the application process for every single graduate entry medical program in the country. Um, I say it every time, I'm gonna be applying to every single one that I at least am eligible for uh, around the country this year, for hopefully for 2023 entry. So in my research of exactly how each of the processes work, I figured that what I would do is turn them into videos so it helps you guys as well kind of navigate this process because as you're probably learning, it's a pretty complicated one and every uni does things a little bit differently. So hopefully these videos kind of summarize that process, uh, make it a little bit easier to kind of digest. So in today's one, what we're gonna do is go through the application process for Australian National University or ANU in Canberra. They're another GEMSAS school. So as I've said in some of the other ones, if you're not familiar with the GEMSAS process, you can obviously check out the uh, applications guide from the last application cycle. That's the most recent one that we have. I've linked that below. But uh, if you wanna hear me ramble on about it as well, then I already did that in quite a bit of detail in the Unimail video from the end of last year. So check that one out. I'll link that below as well. Because what I'll be doing is just going through the bits that are specific to ANU and the way that they do things differently. And I might just reference the fact that they do like standard gem SAS processes for some of the other parts as well. So let's dive straight into it. So the first thing is uh, place types and how many places there are. So we've got CSP, BMP and international places available at ANU. So there are 64 CSP places. There's also an additional 26 BMP places, which remember are part of the CSP program, but they are bonded through the bonded medical place scheme. Then on top of that, there's another 20 international places available, making up a total of 110. The thing to keep in mind is that of the 90 domestic places, 40, roughly 40 of them are reserved for people going through an ANU graduate entry pathway program. Um, I won't go through the details of how that works. I figured that's probably not as relevant to most people watching this, but uh, just be mindful that about only 50 of those 90 domestic places are actually available to non-ANU students that aren't going through that entry process. So we'll break it all down and go through each of the different parts. So the, the first one is the eligible degrees. So if you've done a bachelor's degree, for, in order for it to be eligible, it has to either be three years full-time equivalent and you can still be in your final year while you're making the application or you can also have done an accelerated degree in two years so long as it's still equivalent to three years full-time equivalent. The kind of string attached to that is that if you're using an accelerated degree, it has to have already been completed by the time of application. So it, you can't be in the final year of study of an accelerated degree, it has to have already been completed. If you have a standalone honors uh, degree or you have a master's by coursework, they are also eligible. So long as you've also completed a three years full-time equivalent bachelor's degree beforehand, they can't be on their own. And then conversion degrees are not accepted by ANU. And then they also apply the 10 year rule, but I'll come back to the 10 year rule in a moment in terms of uh, the currency. So in terms of GPA calculations, the process and the minimums, the minimum is a 5.6 weighted GPA using GEMSAS calculations with the times three, two and one weightings as we've seen in all the others. So again, I won't go into details on those. You can check that in the GEMSAS guide or you can check it in the Unimail video where I go into it in a bit more detail. The calculation again, based on the most recent three years full-time equivalent of studies. If you're in your final year of your study and you're wondering how is my GPA for my final year gonna be counted, um, so long as you have at least 0.375 of a full year equivalent available in results by the time of the uh, processing, that is if you've completed at least three of four subjects in semester one of the final year, if you're in your application year and final year at the same time, then your third year or your final year GPA will be calculated based on those subjects. Um, and then that will go in and count as your like final year GPA for consideration for interview. And then it'll become conditional that you maintain a 5.6 minimum by the end of the year if you were to receive a conditional offer. If you've studied less than three subjects in that first semester, then it does not qualify and it probably means that it makes your studies actually ineligible or at least um, if you've done two or less subjects in that first semester of the application year and it's your final year, then effectively they don't get contributed to your final year and instead they'll just take the two years prior to that 
and they'll weight them times two and times one respectively. And then they'll just wait to see what your final GPA is with third year included at the end if you were to get a conditional offer as well. Uh, the other thing is if you have any ungraded passes, this might be due to COVID or anything like that, or just um, because of exceptional circumstances. If you have an ungraded pass, it does not contribute to the GPA calculation. It just gets excluded from the consideration, but it does still count as credit. So if you say had uh, eight subjects in your second year, one of them was an ungraded pass, it'll still count that you've completed the second year. And then as well as that, when they calculate your GPA for that year, they'll just take the seven subjects that are not ungraded passes. They'll only use those in the consideration. It's not like an ungraded pass counts as a 50% or counts as zero or anything like that. Um, it actually works in your favor if you've got any of those effectively. In order for the year to be used as a GPA, you still have to have maintained at least a 0.375 full-time equivalent amount of graded passes in order for it to qualify. And likewise, in your overall degree, um, you need to at least have a minimum of two years full-time equivalent of graded passes of some kind. If you have more than one year's equivalent, so in effectively more than eight uh, subjects with ungraded passes, then the whole degree may become ineligible, but they base that on a case-by-case -case basis. And then finally, if you're using some other kind of graduate program, then graduate diplomas, graduate certificates, masters by research and PhD programs, they're not included in a GPA calculation, but there are percentage bonuses similar to the Deacon system um, that are available if you've done any of those programs. We'll come to those in a moment. So with the 10 year rule, they apply it very, very similarly to other GEMSAS schools, except for where they actually count the 10 years from. So your eligible degree needs to have been completed uh, or conferred. It goes off of the conferral date, not off the date that you completed studies. And that needs to be 10 years prior to the date of application. Most GEMSAS schools do it by um, the 10 years prior to the 1st of January in the year that you would enter into the medical program. This one cuts the window a little bit closer by about seven months or so into May. So we'll take it as the end of May that your degree needs to be completed after the end of May, 10 years prior. So if you're applying this year in 2022 for 2023 entry, then effectively that means your degree to be eligible must have been completed and conferred after the 31st of May, 2012. 10 years prior. Don't quote me on the dates because it just says time of application. I'm taking it as the uh, cutoff date from the last application cycle being the 31st of May. It'll be somewhere around there though, but it might change. The other thing is if you do have an undergraduate degree that is outside of that 10 year window, you can basically requalify it with uh, additional studies that are done inside of 10 windows of the application. Uh, so long as you've done a minimum of half a year's full-time equivalent studies, uh, and it has to have been at a bachelor's degree or higher. So it can be postgraduate, it can be another bachelor's degree. It doesn't have to be completed. You just have to show that you've done at least one semester's worth of full-time study, and then that requalifies your old GPA. So next thing is then GAMSAT. So it's pretty simple, just mostly follows GEMSAS guidelines. You need a minimum of 50 in all three sections, but they use a minimum overall GAMSAT requirement of 55, not 50. Doesn't make a huge difference because competition is pretty high. And so realistically, um, maybe outside of some exceptional circumstances with rural applicants, a 55 is really gonna be below competitive anyway. So you'd probably be aiming up into the 60s and 70s to begin with. Okay, so then the next thing is they've got a bonus scheme. So it's very, very similar to the Deacon scheme where they just add a percentage to your combined standardized GAMSAT and GPA score. If you've done an honors degree, then you get a 2% bonus to that. In order for that to apply, you need to have completed the honors project by the end of the application year. If you've done a master's by research, you also get a 2% bonus, except that needs to be completed prior to application. Or if you've done a PhD, you get a 4% bonus, but that also needs to be completed prior to application to be applied. In order to actually get any of these bonuses, you need to still meet the minimums for GPA and GAMSAT, and you can't combine and get multiple bonuses. You can only get one. Effectively, it's one per customer kind of thing. Then indigenous and rural applicants, no changes there. They just follow the standard GEMSAS process. So indigenous students can apply direct to ANU and uh, most likely won't require a GAMSAT result. Rural applicants, you just need to meet the GEMSAS requirements for rurality. You'll tick a box in your GEMSAS application and then you'll fill in a form as part of your application that will put you into consideration for the rural applicant scheme. Then with interview processes, they do a 50-50 weighting of your standardized GPA and standardized GAMSAT. Um, they put those together, 
create a ranked list and then offer interview places. I haven't seen anything about how many interviews they actually offered relative to their intake, but it should be usually around about double. So with an intake of 110, we might see interviews around about 200-ish, somewhere around that mark. And then finally offers, again, pretty much the same thing. So it's a 50% weighting to your interview score, 25% to your standardized GPA, 25% to your standardized GAMSAT, although technically they combine them and say 50% for the combined GPA GAMSAT score and 50% interview. And then they make offers based on a ranked list from there. And again, if you're in your final year of study, then it's a conditional offer and you need to complete that study by the 31st of December of that application year. And then also show that you've maintained that minimum of 5.6 on your GPA. And then you can keep that offer and then enter into med the next year. If you've already finished your degree, it's a hard offer. You can basically just accept it and wait for things to start. Cool. And that's basically it. I wanted to keep it nice and simple. ANU has a pretty straightforward process. A couple of little bonuses in there along the way, but otherwise they do things pretty stock standard. Hopefully this was helpful, cleared things up, and uh, I will see you guys in the next video.